little town it's been. And some of the traumas that have been experienced here include the bombardment of Wrangell. Um, actually, before that, we had the Kaziar Gold Rush, and in 1867, in the town was com the village was completely overrun by miners coming up here from California and other places. There were a series of epidemics, and then I mentioned that bombardment. And there's been racism and injustices and the, those kinds of things. And they're not, they're not specific to Wrangell. They're common, really, to Native Americans. And the whole process of colonization and the loss of culture and language has been traumatizing. And so that's why we wanted to start with the breathing exercises so that you'll have that as in your toolkit as we go through these discussions because some of them are going to be difficult and painful. So I wanted to mention that and then, let's see, Virginia was going to, where, I guess she stepped out of the room. So we'll pause for a moment. Stand up, take a stretch, do some breathing, take a, take a two minute break. Oh wait, Matthew's talking next. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Matthew Spelberg, my name is Matthew Spelberg, and I have the great honor of serving on the organizing committee. It's wonderful to see you all here, and I want to express my great thanks to the people of Wrangell for hosting us. Uh, I have right now just a very brief announcement for um, presenters. If you are presenting with audiovisual materials um, and you're wondering about how to get those materials to your projector, um, one way to do that is to email uh, the co our conference email address, which is sharingourknowledgeconference at gmail.com. And we have other ways of figuring it out, like you can bring your own laptop or you can bring your own USB stick. If you are a presenter and you have a question about how to get uh, materials, to your presentation station on a screen projected behind you. You can come find me. Again, my name is Matthew, and I'm the fellow in the red bandana. And if a presenter, if, you, if those of you in the room happen to see a presenter and they're asking how to do that, you'd say, find the guy in the red bandana, or my dear colleague, Frank Ecker, who's the gentleman in the yellow hat right there. So um, again, if you have any technical questions, yellow hat, red bandana. You go on. Okay. So um, one other thing I should mention is that, you know, when you registered, you were given this program. So we've had a few minor program changes. So refer to the handout that's inside your program for, you know, to decide which session to go to next. Okay. So now we have Virginia Oliver. It's me again. It's my great pleasure. You know, earlier when I was introducing myself, I forgot to tell you, my Tlingit name is Juan Tlain and my Tlaitkach Enach Juan Tlain. Ah, Chak Nachatsati, Wudzinadi Ayachat, Kir Kwan Dachayachat, Kwatle, Kachanak Kudzati, Kunachish. Right now, I take great pleasure in um, presenting uh, Did You Suck? Tiaton lady from Wrangell, and the caretaker of all leader Raven's hat, Miss Deborah O'Gara. Hmm. Good morning, everybody. So thanks to Jamie Ann and and um, uh, Michaela for starting it, starting us off. So yesterday she promised me a drum roll, but um, maybe that'll come later. All right, I have to be able to see what I wrote, right? Okay, um, first I want to thank Jacqueline as she walks out the room. Jacqueline Estes is my cousin and she um, um, convinced me that I should speak at this about a research project that I started two years ago, um, or I started the research journey two years ago, 
And I said, but I'm not quite done with it. I haven't even started my actual research. I've only started my, finished my coursework. And she says, well, just tell us what you already know. So um, that's what I'm going to do. So I want to thank Jacqueline. She did not tell me until just a couple days ago that I was first on the agenda, though. So for that, I'm going to figure out how to get her back. <laughs> Does this work? No. And I asked um, Sue, I asked Matthew if he could open up the curtains, because I do not have a PowerPoint. I'm very old school and have not mastered the art of PowerPoint, and hopefully um, I will get to be a ripe old age and not have to master the art of PowerPoint. All right. As Virginia said, my clinket name is Dejok Suk, and I've started, I've started I've begun um, starting off my speeches that way rather than my English name, just to do a little turnaround. My English name is Deborah O'Gara. I'm Clinkett, Yupik, Irish, and a raven from the Teton tribe, Teton clan. And I currently live in Petersburg, just across the channel. My mom, Carol O'Gara, and my auntie, Joan Bejo, have been throughout my life two of the most influential women in my life. Both of them were born and raised in Mountain Village in the YK Delta, way up north. They helped me to find my place in the world, though I find my place constantly changing. Their mother, my grandmother, was Frances Tamry Shepherd. She was born here in Wrangell and died a while before I met her. Actually, I, had just, I was six months old when she died, and she was way too young, as many of our ancestors were. My great-grandmother was Tilly Paul Tamry. She was a civil rights activist, as many of you already know, and the mother to William and Louis Paul, Louis Paul. She spent her life building bridges between Clinkett traditional ways and the Western Christian teachings. Tilly's second husband, my great-grandfather, William Tamry, was a community leader also here in Wrangell, a peacemaker, and a carver. My family is a mixture of fighters, survivors, and victims, with education, successful careers in law, government and church, alcoholism, violence, poverty, challenges, and trauma. My life has been a rocky journey that eventually became safe, comfortable, and filled with joy. Recently, in the last 12, 15 years, I've learned to weave, and I consider that to be the art of my ancestors. I've we I weave spruce root and cedar bark basketry, and most recently, in the last 10 years, raven's tail and chilcat. Through this gift, I have found sobriety, in an ever-growing circle of strong women and other two-spirited weavers. We share stories, lessons, mistakes, victories, and we connect with each other and reconnect with our ancestors. My clan, the Teton, which I now, now, now I have my close-up glasses on so I can't see who all is in the room, but I know there's a, there's a few Teton out here. And, um, um, Lane, and I can't see actually past Lane, so I won't try. But you all know who you are. Our clan is small, with many of us learning our history, relationships with other clans, and our language. As I learn more about the designs and significance Chilcat robes had before colonialization, I dream of the day when I can create a story robe for our Teton clan. So I try to learn more about weaving and traditional Chilcat design, but more on that later. A little bit about my professional career. I have worked in the legal field for um, just over 31 years, and for most of my legal career I have worked for and with travel governments or courts, and since 2007, I have worked here in Alaska for my own tribe, the Clinket and Haida, as well as several other tribes um, throughout the state. 
For the Clinkett and Haida Court, I was the first magistrate, then the elected chief justice, and then pre presiding justice. I helped to build our court as well as build strong partnerships with state nonprofit agencies and other tribes. Two years ago, as retirement from law was coming into view, I just, I just see it right over the horizon. I enrolled at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the PhD program in indigenous studies because I didn't have enough to do, I suppose. I'm not sure yet why, but, but it's started me on this fabulous journey that I'm gonna tell you about. And that decision two years ago brought me here to stand at this podium to ta tell you what I'm gonna be doing for the next year. <laughs> Throughout my legal career, I have worked on many issues, gained a lot of experience developing and implementing laws and policies related to domestic violence, child support, child welfare, and dealing with jurisdictional matters particularly when it came to child welfare, child support, and criminal law. I have worked as a prosecutor, an advocate, a mediator, and a judicial officer. Even though I have done all of these things for and with tribes, most of the justice systems have been, that I have worked in have been modeled or have been Western court systems. I believe we as indigenous people can do better than the Western court systems, which is why I have embarked on this um, research journey. This belief led me to the question, how did we as indigenous people resolve disputes and hold individuals accountable for bad behavior before colonialization? So that's a little bit about my background and how I came to be where I am and the decisions that I've made. So a little bit more about what my research is focusing on. When I first developed this basic research question that sort of motivated me to um, enroll into a PhD program, and it was more, although I do joke with some of my friends that I really wanted, I'd been, I've been a judge for 15 years, and with a doctor, I'd have to, they'd have to start calling me Dr. Judge. <laughs> so I'm not gonna make anybody call me that, or even probably doctor, because it's, that's a, it's a real Western, um, Western title. Mostly I'm looking for ways that I can help our tribes here in this state. So when I first developed the question, the underlying question, what did we as indigenous people used to do before colonialization to solve disputes? I wanted to research all of the regions in Alaska. I soon discovered that in order to take on this broad scope, it would take me about 10 or 20 years, and I still wanted to retire at some point in my life before I was too old to enjoy some free time. So I narrowed my focus to the Clinket right here in Southeast. It is my hope that at the next sharing our knowledge gathering, I will um, be able to share what my actual findings are. For now, I simply will outline what I'm doing and how I'm gonna go about answering this underlying question. In this research project, I will first look at traditional and customary Clinket protocols and laws that were in use prior to colonialization. I will look for specific practices that were used for resolving disputes by reviewing and analyzing stories, oral histories, songs, paying close attention to the ways in which Clinket people held each other accountable and promoted healing and repaired um, repair for individuals or clans who had been harmed in various ways. I will also review, study, and try to learn more about what my weaving teacher, Lily Hope, has called uh, living documents. And I just love that term because it's, it really documents is such a Western term, but living, when you think of it in the Western context, 
documents are not seen as living, but our living documents are our totems, our carvings, our form lines, our chill cat robes. And, you know, just this, this, just this very moment, I'll add to that living documents, our songs and our stories, because we're still writing them. We're still creating those songs and stories. I hope to find, well, I, I'll just go off a, a little aside. The living documents and the research documents that I'm going to find in the museums and the, and the um, archives ties what, I'm been, what I have been doing for the last 15 years, which is um, learning my ancestors' art forms. So I'm really excited about being able to tie a lot of different aspects of my life journey into one big, huge project, so. Okay. I hope to find specific practices that may be integrated into the developing indigenous justice systems that have re-emerged, not just emerged, because they existed before in some form, but re-emerged among the Alaska Native communities over the last 20 to 30 years. My goal is to identify as many of the old ways as I can that will be available, will then be available to our modern day tribal governments to use and integrate as they develop more culturally significant methods for resol resolving disputes. And these disputes can be civil, criminal, community wide, or individually based in an equitable manner that promotes peace, healing, and returns wellness and healthy balance to all of our communities, whether we're rural or urban. I believe my research many years, I began my research many years ago as I slowly reached out to learn more about my own ancestors. It is with these ancestors and my colleagues, some of whom are watching on Zoom or are here in the, in the audience, that I discover new things every day. I am inspired by, uh, to search for effective dispute resolution approaches that are Clinket and indigenous based. To find these approaches, I need to investigate the values and learn how these were grounded in Clinkett society and the basis upon which resolutions were achieved. To find what were the primary dispute resolution practices, I must explore what was happening before the indigenous way of life was disrupted by the Russian colonists and the, US, the United States invasion. Once I have outlined the traditional practices and protocols followed by my Clinket ancestors, my ultimate questions are, are any of these practices in whole or in part adaptable for use today? I think some of them might not be, but some of them might be. So what are they? If yes, what are they? And um, what would be the ideal form to revive these practices? Can traditional Clinket practices be used locally in partnership with the current Western court systems? If so, how would that look? And for those who are following some of the legal developments throughout the country and here in Alaska, you, you'll know that there are some efforts to integrate, to bring indigenous values into the court systems and vice versa. A few other questions that I will, that will be helpful in my research and coming up with um, my conclusions is were the practices universal or specific to each clan? And I'm still learning that, but I do know basically that there's a lot of clans out, out there. Some of them are small, some of them are large, some of them are active, some of them are not. So were the practice, traditional practices universal across Clinket country? or specific to clans, to just individual specific clans. Once a dispute was resolved, how was it then enforced and by whom? Or was there a need to, for enforcement? Was there so much cohesion and um, value amongst our clans and our communities that 
enforcement that we sort of envisualize in this Western society not even necessary, or is it some other form? Were the resolutions simple or complex, public or private, fair and just or e equitable? Of course, I don't yet have the answers to these questions, so I'm sort of teasing you all and myself with these questions and um, hoping that you'll then register for the conference in two years, because I'm hoping to have answers to many of these questions by then. What do I know now? An indigenous justice system is essentially a court or dispute resolution system or form that is a function of and supported by a tribe or clan. Today, in this Western-dominated society, it is our tribal governments that have the authority and the recognition to govern rather than the clans that was um, more traditional. That said, I believe it is vital to reach back and learn about Clinkett society before the establishment of our current tribal governments, as there is much to learn from how our clans functioned. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we, we need to modify or dismantle or, or throw out our tribal governments, but in order to help our tribal governments as they are developing justice systems, they will benefit from, as we all will, benefit from knowing what we used to do in our clan structure. There are a variety of types of tribal courts, indigenous justice systems or dispute resolution forms. I use, and you'll notice this throughout this talk and any time you talk to me, that I use the term justice systems rather than tribal courts. And I use that because court really um, gives a Western vision of, of the uh, Western style courts with a judge in a black robe sitting behind a big bench up higher than everybody else and making decisions for people who have come to them because they're unable to make decisions or to on high hold somebody accountable in a very punitive manner. That's the Western court system. So I try to stay away from the term court just to have a fresh view of justice systems. There may be, and I'm trying to keep the door open, there may be a better term than justice, but I haven't yet found it. So, um, so I may have a better term next in two years, I'm not sure. The tribal court or justice system is, a, is varied in, in types as, is, there is as many types of tribal courts and tribal justice systems as there are number of tribes. Each tribe has an inherent authority to establish its own system to fit its own particular community. Some of the tribes in the United States, including here in Alaska, have justice systems that function and operate like the Western court system. Some have elected tribal council persons to preside over disputes, while other tribes convene a panel of elders or clan leaders to, dis to discuss and decide disputes and everything in between. Some have written laws and procedures, while others do not, relying solely on oral tradition. And some tribes do not have a justice system or written laws, or sadly, do not have sufficient collective memory within their citizens, citizenry to remember or know their traditional laws and practices. So there's not gonna be any one, one system or one thing that I'm gonna find. The most important thing to remember is that each of the Alaska tribes in Alaska has its own history, values, and traditions. Each tribe has the opportunity and inherent sovereignty to create its own justice system with its own purpose, characteristics, procedures, and processes. Some of the Alaska tribes have robust and very active justice systems, while some justice systems have very dormant, extinct, and or severely modified um, systems because of colonialization, capitaliz capitalism, and religious influences that have been imposed on us for 
um, over 200 years or more. Even so, there are many that have retained and remembered their specific traditional history, values, methods for resolving disputes. Two examples, which are actually near and dear to my heart. And it's been very exciting to see some of the emergence of tribal courts first down in the lower 48, where I first started practicing, and here in Alaska, where I live now. In Mountain Village, where, remember, my mom and my auntie were born and raised, Mountain Village is a very small Yupik, lower Yukon River village. When I visited and spent my summers there, it was only 500 people. I think it's about eight or 900 people now. The tribe there has begun reestablishing a justice system with, an elders, with elders judges sitting either as individuals or as a panel using restorative justice process and a, the court starts with a prayer. All parties that come in with disputes, whether it's criminal or civil, including the judge, sign an oath to be fair and impartial. So everybody's on the same, same level. And they all sign this agreement that they will keep the proceedings, whatever is talked about, confidential. The court started in 2007 and today appears to be, and I say appears because I haven't um, looked at that court system for a couple of years now, but they were handling substance abuse, which is a huge problem in that village, domestic violence, and other wellness-oriented services focused on healing and finding solutions. In contrast, the Clinkett Haida Court, which I'm a citizen of, also opened its court doors in 2007 and functions with quite a few characteristics of the Western court system, such as law-trained judges, such as myself and many others, a raised bench, a black robe for the judicial officers, formal proceedings with presentation of evidence and sworn testimony, written laws and procedures, and all of the court proceedings being recorded. The Clinkett and Haida written laws governing children and families also contain very a very important provision, which helps to um, round out the Clinkett and Haida court. This provision is entitled Clinkett and Haida Traditional and Cultural Systems, and it outlines the traditional values, clan system, and important rights of children to be safe, secure, and to know who they are and that these values are mandated for all judicial officers to follow. So even though the Clinkett and Haida Court is modeled after the Western style court, it contains traditional cultural values that are embedded in its laws that help provide guidance for all who appear in that court and all who make decisions. It is vital that each tribal government um, set up and maintain a justice system of some kind, or at least consider the option. Establishing a court or a justice system is the manifestation of exercising sovereignty. And I'm not here, I mean, I could spend a whole hour just talking about sovereignty and jurisdiction and being all legalistic and all that good stuff, but I'm not going to. That will be another lecture. And, um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about that. A little side note on restorative justice, which I've mentioned several times so far this morning. There is an abundance of literature, discussion, and developing programs following a restorative justice method in both Western and indigenous courts, not just here in Alaska, not just here in this country, but around the world in lots of different countries. It is impossible to mention tribal courts in the legal community or social change community um, without several references being made to restorative justice courts. Many believe that restorative justice models that are gaining prominence over the last 40 to 50 years um, are based and grounded on indigenous knowledge, traditions, and cultural practices. This could be true. It, this assumption may have some truth in, in it, how deep or how strong that truth is, I really don't know. 
Though to reach this conclusion that restorative justice is grounded and rooted in indigenous knowledge systems almost brings us to the assumption that indigenous knowledge and traditional practices are universal, which I don't believe that they are. I think we have a lot of different practices, a lot of different cultures. So I have, so, so in that way, I have a little bit of a problem. And of course, as I'm reading, getting ready for this research project, that was a rabbit hole that I went down. And, and luckily, I was able to pull myself out. Restorative justice is a fascinating topic, but it's not the topic that I have taken on to research. So don't look for that in two years as part of my um, dissertation report, OK? But it is fascinating. And, um, and again, I think there's some good things about it. I'm not sure I agree with all of the Western courts taking it on as now, that, now we're being indigenous or now we're being traditionally cultural. I'm not, I have some hesitations about that. But more on that, I, I digress. All right, back to my research. What is the problem? Why, and this, this helped to motivate me to do this because at, as you, you know, the first five minutes of this morning, I talked about who I am and what I have done. And I have worked in the Western courts. I have worked in criminal law. I was a prosecutor. I've worked in the state here, here in the state court in Alaska. What is the problem and why do I think we can do it better? Here's some short statistics. The Alaska state court system, at least on the criminal side, is not working especially for Alaska Natives and other people of color. The Alaska Criminal Justice Commission, in its 2021 annual report, made the following conclusions. And this is recent. This is last year's report. People who are Alaska Native and black are overrepresented in the incarcerated population relative to the general population while people who are white are underrepresented. Alaska Native people comprise only 16% of the general population in this state, but represent 42% of those who are incarcerated. By January 2020, the number of people who were detained in jail or on, um, on uh, conditioned re conditional release because of the overcrowding in the jails, so I include that. They were detained pre-trial. They had only been charged with the crime, not yet convicted or sentenced. Was nearly equal to the number of people who were in jail after a sentence. Which means almost half of the people in jail right now have not been convicted of a crime. That's the short way of saying that. And then, of course, the recidivism rate is horrible. In addition to the high recidivism rates and increasing overrepresentation of Alaska Natives in the state criminal system, Alaska communities, both rural and urban, have become increasingly unsafe, especially for women and children. The Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, in their, again, very, most, very recent uh, report uh, of 2019, reports that women in Alaska are murdered at three times the rate for the rest of the rest of the United States. Reported rapes are almost four times higher than the rest of the United States. And I emphasize reported because we all know that most rapes do not go unreported. And lastly, the rate of reported and substantiated child abuse and neglect is nearly two times higher than the US rate. And that's in here in Alaska. This is just a tiny snapshot of the incarceration, disproportionality, recidivism, and violence, um, violence rates from recent um, Alaska courts. There has been some improvement um, in some corners. However, the picture is clear. The current state system and public safety systems are failing. The question I want to explore are, the questions I want to explore are, is it possible for well-developed, resourced, 
and, and resourced, I mean funding, um, tribal justice systems grounded in culture and traditional values, can they do better? I think they can. And I think that the, the improvement can, of our tribal justice systems can also have a residual effect on our Western style state court systems as well. Our successes can bleed over into the rest of the state and everybody in the state, including our neighbors. Ultimately, I am looking for practices, protocols, or laws that will improve accountability and healing for those who have been harmed and those who are doing the harm. So my approach, and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. In my readings, I have done so far, and the knowledge that I have accumulated over my, career, my legal career, I have come to believe that the Clinket, as well as other indigenous communities around the world, have, develop, have a developed sense set of traditional laws that are based or rooted on integration or the merging of accountability, reciprocity, and equity. And I say these three concepts separately. They're separate words, but they work together. They're integrated. They're merged. They're not separate. And we can't have just one of them separately. They, we really need to look at them together. And, and many of our tribal cultures, even though we're not universal, because I've already said that, right? But many of our tribal cultures have those concepts already traditionally. As I began my preliminary readings, I kept this approach in, approach in mind. My initial, initial hypothesis appeared sound, and I developed a plan to sift through the journals of traders, uh, missionaries, and government officials, and the written, and the written oral histories of Clinket elders to find evidence that could help um, support and prove this hypothesis. However, as I completed my coursework and turned my attention to finalizing my research questions and my plan, it all was not quite making sense. If I confine my research to a single purpose of proving or disproving a narrow question, I'm gonna miss something. And I don't know what that something is, but I'm gonna miss something. I'm not sure, um, I already said that. So if I confined my search to laws, to these key words and my, you know, as I'm looking through and reading through stories and stuff, and I confine my research to laws, disputes, resolutions, punishment, crime, or other such terms as that, I'm not gonna get it all. I'm not gonna get a full picture. So the narrow scope that I was focusing on was contradictory with the relational indigenous worldview that I had been studying and that I know intellectually and um, internally just from my life experiences. I should not narrow my research to just looking at those key words and miss that relationship. So what do I do now? <laughs> so I sat on that for a while. I wasn't quite sure what I was gonna do, but I did know that the key was to talk to other people, which I did do. And some, some who are again in Zoom land and some who are here in, in um, the meeting room here with us today have been part of my discussions talking out loud. So what should we do? And I have to say, some of the questions or some of the readings that I did in my coursework helped, but also just reading and talking and watching YouTube lectures is always a good idea. So in preparation for the research project, I did, um, I had done a preliminary um, investigation on the history of Alaska, which was fascinating, with an emphasis on Clinket history before and during Western contact. 
um, status of the Alaska courts, which is really an aside. My, my project is not on how dismal the Alaska court system is. It's on the possibilities of improving the Alaska court system and our own systems. And the restorative, I already told you about my rabbit hole on the restorative justice. So what I really want to know is, and this helped hone down my research question, is it possible to find and document traditional, culturally based dispute resolution practices before Western civil co colonialization of some or all of the indigenous people in what we now know as Alaska? Is it possible to find that? That was the question. That helped broaden but focus my research. If yes, then what method did I use to get there? Because the other thing that I ultimately want to end up with is a roadmap template for other tribes to do the same thing, but not have to go through two years of coursework and then another two years of research, right? But I'm focusing on Clinkett. I'd love to get ha, end up with a roadmap that I can say to the Yupiks or the Haidas or the Athabascans, this is, this is one way of doing, of helping to strengthen your courts. And I don't have all the answers. I won't, for those who know me know I'm, I don't pretend to have all the answers. This is just one little part. A secondary issue will be that I will address um, that I may reach, I'm not sure if I will, but I may reach, is um, the, making some recommendations um, along with that roadmap template and looking for ways that my ultimate purpose is to focus on indigenous justice systems, not the Western court system. But as we know, we live in an integrated society. The Western non-indigenous people are members of our family. They're members of our community. They're our neighbors. Um, and I think that the Western court system can improve and benefit from what our indigenous justice systems can do. So, we coexist. We didn't 500, 600, 1,000 years ago, but we do today. And as much as some days, when things get really bad, we'd like to say, let's go back to the way it was 500 years ago when life was a lot simpler. As much as we'd like to do that, we can't. Really, our, our families and our communities are blended. And so should some of our social services and, and um, um, justice systems. All right. Just checking the time here. All right, my research questions for those who are taking notes. What are some of the traditional laws for the Clinket before Western contact? What were the traditional dispute resolution practices teachings used for? And for what types of disputes were they interpersonal within the clan? Inter interpersonal between two or more clans? Were they about land and resource? And, um, or all of the above. How were the disputes resolved? How were the different types of disputes resolved? Because I think there was different things depending on the complexity or the simpleness of the disputes. And what were, the, what were some of the various resolutions that were decided? And, you know, I don't have it in this list of questions, but it goes without saying, who was, who was making the decision? Was it tribal leaders? Was it our shamans? Was it the women? Was it the elders? Was it a combination? Did it depend on the type of dispute or the possible resolution? I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm going to find. Once resolution was achieved, how was the resolution enforced? And we were just talking this morning or last night about enforcement. It's like enforcement is another Western term, enforcement. Was it peer pressure? Was it um, um, the, 
a high value on belonging to the community that helped to enforce decisions? Or was there an enforcement? I mean, today we have jails and prosecutors and police officers and all kinds of things for enforcement. I don't think we had that back then. And then one thing that I just added as I was writing this um, in preparation for today, what were some of the healing practices for both individuals and, com and the entire community, the clan, the tribe, the community? Um, those, I think, as I think more about this, had to have been a part integrated into it. Of course, the answers to these questions are not easily revealed. And they're not going to be, I'm not going to find them in writing. I'm going to have to deduce it, make assumptions, talk to people, make my best guess. The earlier uh, first contact written accounts were written by explorers, missionaries, government officials that did not understand and generally did not want to understand an indigenous worldview that they were coming in contact with. And so those historical documents that are going to contain a lot of information are not going to be all of it. The other thing, as I'm going through this, I'm going to actually be looking for gaps in accounts of particular events. I'm developing a timeline that I can, a timeline of, of battles, of bombardments, of disease, of migration, of, of um, significant events that we know occurred, um, starting before contact and moving forward. And I'll be looking for the lack of information about traditional practices during certain times, because that lack of information, either through our stories or our songs, are going to be important too, because, and it, we all have heard this, there was some things that happened to our ancestors that have no words. There, we have no ability to actually talk about it or tell what happened. So those are going to be significant as well. So in my research of mostly li literature, looking at the written stuff that is available, as well as songs and the living documents that I've already talked about, I'm going to go from pre-contact to at contact, to at contact and soon thereafter, because that's a sort of a big area. Modern day, what's happening right now today, and then just some of the theoretical and philosophical writings that are happening internationally, because there's an abundance of stuff out there. So if you'll notice, I've started off with, with um, looking at clink at worldview as best as I can, pre-contact, and then ending with indigenous worldview at the end. Um, okay. I'm not going to go through what I want to actually save at least five minutes for, or so for, for questions. I timed this out last night. It was only 40 minutes. But it, when I read it to myself, I wasn't ad-libbing, which, as you can see, I do a lot of that. <laughs> While this is not one of my primary research questions. It is important because the reality of our tribes, communities today, well, actually, I already said that. We're blended. We're, we're blended. All of us are we're blended. I mean, look at me. I'm blended. I'm Irish, Yupik, and Clinkett. And I grew up being told, hearing stories about Yup Eskimos and Indians didn't get along. And I'm going, well, how did I come about then? <laughs> Somebody got along. <laughs> All right. In conclusion, the task of mutual respect, which is needed to a certain degree, is a complex en endeavor, but necessary to achieve pluralism. And again, this goes to the fact that we live in an integrated society, and for the most part, an international society. 
as our, as our um, First Nations relatives who, are, who came to share this gathering with us um, attest to. I believe, I believe a certain level of cooperation and mutual respect is the right way to proceed. Tribal communities, especially here in Alaska, are reliant and integra integrated on, Western, on the Western system, not just with the courts, but also economically, educationally, and in the delivery of public safety and social services. A good start, a good start to developing each indigenous justice system is to discuss what values, culture, traditions we want as central components. So I'm going back to the beginning. What do we want? What do our communities need? And court systems or justice systems don't have to take on everything. Because we live in an integrated society, tribes can decide that the state should deal with the criminal stuff and the tribes should deal with the children issues, or vice versa, or a tribe can take on everything. I start this research journey into Clinkett's traditional resolution practices with the hope of finding options for improving various justice systems operating today. I'm, I'm not ever going to say we should go back. My knees wouldn't handle it. Um, kneeling, kneeling on the dirt floor. <laughs> There's a really nice quote from from um, Professor Zuni Cruz, which I'm going to skip just for um, because of time, but it's a really good quote and just helps. It, it, it pulls together everything that I've just been saying. If we as indigenous people can choose, let us choose a path that has a chance to work. The Western justice system simply is not working. We already know indigenous justice has worked for thousands of years before contact. This research is aimed at finding the tools to unbury and remember what was working and to bring some of those tools, likely not all of them, some of these tools forward into our modern world so that we, can, we as indigenous people, our families and our neighbors, um, can survive for another 10,000 years. It is a time to return, and I'm just going to draw from the um, theme of today, this year's gathering. It's really a time to return to peace for our people and for um, all of the communities that we live in. Gunas Chish, thank you for your attention, and I hope we have, I hope I left enough time for questions. So those people that are in, in jail before they've even been um, pro prosecuted, um, is it because they can't afford bail? Partly, yes. Or probably 75% or 80% of the, yes, but they can't what afford about, bail. What about what, the other percentage? Why are they there? Um, and this is my guess. I don't have any statistics on that. but. Um, when somebody gets released from jail on criminal charges, they often have conditions that they have to follow. So if, if they get released and then don't follow those conditions, they could be curfew, no drinking, stay away from a certain person, um, report to your probation officer or the pretrial officer, as some places, um, then they get sent back for violation of conditions, which is another charge. So then they got two charges, and it go and it's a merry-go-round. It's a it's a cycle. Um, thank you. I'm really um, grateful that you're on this endeavor for us as a community and Kanishish. So I have a couple of questions, um, but I'll save some of them for later when we can talk. Um, I guess my first one of the things that I first thought of was communication, right? And we talk a lot about that. And some of you may know Scott Chafin. 
He's my older brother, and he's been a police officer in Southeast and Klawak and Wrangell and for a long time. Um, and he, we talked about this, and he said that when you're, he was working with somebody who was non-native, predominantly uh, Caucasian, they would deny it. They'd be even sitting in jail, you know, and convicted, and they would deny what they did. Yep. He said, but when he worked with a native person, you know, Clinkett Hyde or Simshan down here in Southeast, or, you know, and we have other native groups too, but they would tell the truth. Yep. He would say, did you do this? And they said, yes, I did it. Yep. And there's, you know, the proof I did it. <laughs> yep. Because of the honesty and the expectation of honesty. So is that going to be addressed in your paper? It could, yes, and I have run into that, both as a prosecutor and as a judge. Um, Again, we don't have universal traits, but sometimes we do. And natives are historically and just humanly honest. You ask us a direct question and we answer the question directly. And we haven't really figured out that when a cop asks you a question, you say, I want a lawyer. <laughs> That's not in our, we, we, we don't think about that. Um, so I think in the, um, because I worked quite a long time in a uh, tribal court as a prosecutor, and I would ask the question, well, did you do it? Because I'm not going to continue prosecuting if they didn't do it. Did you do it? And then they'd say yes, if they did. And I'd say, what do you think should be your um, punishment? What, what can the court do that will help you to learn your lesson? And therein lies the difference. Whereas if it's a Western, and that was in a tribal court that I was working at. So therein lies a difference in, I'm not necessarily going to recommend, nor is the judge gonna necessarily recommend jail time because what, he, what that person might need is treatment or a house to live in or a job or something. And so the, indigenous justice systems in a fair and just system is going to look for solutions rather than punishment. So in that way, your, your question is going to get addressed in that we have the opportunity to do um, the, what's, what we have grown up to see as criminal activity be dealt with in a much different way. And that hurt people hurt people. And so when a crime, a personal injury, for instance, happens, an assault happens, there's a victim, yes, that has been harmed in some way, but there's also the person who has done the harm that needs some kind of healing as well. And in that way, my research and just my philosophy on life addresses that. Thanks for the question. I was wondering, you spoke a little bit about this, but I wonder if you could expand on it. Uh, you spoke about uh, the possibility of more integration with the mainstream justice system, integrating uh, traditional Clinket justice with those ideas. Um, how, I, I'm from Canada where we have judges, we have people in our legal system who are really uh, trying very hard right now to be dynamic about this and are asking us how can we, um, what, what, what kind of improvements can we make? Mm -hmm. And so we are in a very uh, kind of a dynamic time with these issues. Would you say that in Alaska the mainstream system is making those attempts to really actively work with you to find different solutions? Yes and no. More no than yes. Um, I think there's individual, it's not system-wide, that's the problem. There's individual judges who want to hear from, if, for instance, in a child welfare case, there's individual judges who say, we need to hear from the tribe what should happen with, the, with these children, or I'm not going to proceed. But it is not universal. It is not across the board. It is really just the rare judge. There are some attorneys that practice in the state court that believe that having, having tribal 
um, participation in the state court proceedings would be a benefit, but they don't know how to get there. They don't know how to, how to do it. Um, so it's not there yet. And there, and, and I'll just take a, a second to say, um, it was probably seven or eight years ago there was, um, he's now retired, but Judge Smith, sorry, my mom's calling. <laughs> she always calls at the, <laughs> she always calls when I'm in the middle of something. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll call her back. <laughs> um, Judge Smith, and I'm trying to remember his first name, um, from up north, he retired, and on his way out, he started um, what he called um, circle sentencing, and he um, wanted to provide um, the, tri the Alaska Native criminal defendants who were facing um, conviction and sentencing. He wanted to provide an opportunity for that person's tribe to have input on the sentencing. Sounds really good, right? It was a good first step. But when, but when the, but when the um, agreement came down from the state for the tribes to look at, it was full of all kinds of conditions. Very, very uh, patronizing, very controlling, very, um, we want you to be involved, but we want you to do it our way. So, again, there's, yes, a little bit of movement, but it is glacier <laughs> um, movement. It's, uh, I think, I, I've actually been known to say that glaciers move faster than the state of Alaska, <laughs> especially under global warming, right? <laughs> so. so, thank you so much. Dave. Thank you all for paying attention and... And thank you guys for my rock. So we have a small gift for you. So one of the one of the reasons why we picked Deb to be first is because I wanted to give you some insight into what scholars go through the kind of thinking and, and uh, deep thought and self-exploration that goes into some of the research that they do. So as you listen to the, the speakers throughout, everybody who's here is a volunteer. All, all of us on the organizing committee and all of the speakers have done this. Some, most have paid their own way. A few have employers who paid their way to come here. So let's always be really appreciative of, of the people who um, come to do this. Let me, let me get my program, I'll be right back. So that, that was a plenary session where everybody is here together and now we're going to have concurrent sessions. We have one here with Ben Paul.